I don't know if I've actually uh, spoken on this topic completely. I know I have addressed um, people's attitudes regarding Christianity. I began to think a little bit about over the years some of the people I have met. And I have come to realize that sometimes those who seem to be the happiest people, you actually come to find out are oftentimes the least happy. And sometimes it appears that those who seem to have the least and those who seem to uh, maybe be the ones that would be most likely to be unhappy or depressed people, they actually seem to be the ones who are the happiest. Well, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about being a happy and useful Christian. Oftentimes, we don't really know if, where somebody is emotionally. We don't know if they're happy. We don't know if they're sad because oftentimes we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But we do know this, and you can go back and look at a number of studies. Uh, for the most part, people want to be happy. Uh, if you go back, you'll notice that the majority of people are striving for some type of a goal, something that will allow them to be happy. I will have to say this, it's interesting. There are a certain group of people out there, though, that are the exception to the rule. And you probably have known a couple of these people or even the maybe uh, certain stereotypical groups, there are people actually who do not want to be happy. They're happy actually being depressed. Uh, there are certain people who are, in, they enjoy controversy. They even enjoy very grim subjects such as death and things like that. There's a certain couple of groups in particular. But for the majority of society, that's not what we find. We find that people want to be happy. They want to feel loved and they want to feel needed. Uh, they want to feel that their life has some type of purpose or some type of, of meaning. And certainly as Christians, that's how we want to feel as children of God. We want to feel like we're actually doing something, that we're part of something bigger, that our Christianity and the effects of our Christianity are worthwhile. Now with that being said, there are many people who oftentimes do not feel happy unless in their own mind they're leaving a mark in history or unless they are somebody of notoriety or maybe uh, somebody in the congregation. Uh, what I mean is, is everybody seems to know who they are uh, and their happiness really depends on what they consider to be, I guess, crowning achievements. Let me make a, a very general statement here that I think is true. For the majority of us who are here right now, we're not going to make much of an impact on society or history. Nobody will probably know who the majority of us are. But with that being said, Let's take it to another level. We can still be happy Christians, and we can be Christians who affect generations to come. We may only affect our families, but that should be important enough. And so today I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about being a happy and useful Christian. One of the things I think we understand as we begin to talk about having a happy, useful life involves the feeling that actually I am a person who is useful, that I'm a person of... of uh, of being beneficial to the congregation and to others around me. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. It says, As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye walk worthy of God, who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Now, there are a number of ways that we can, uh, as a Christian, be useful and walk worthy of God. Certainly we know that we're useful to the kingdom when we're in some way trying to teach the gospel, as we're trying to some way enlarge the kingdom. Certainly that is the way that we are beneficial. Uh, oftentimes we are seen as being beneficial when we do the work of the local congregation. Uh, that could be seen in a number of areas, whether from the smallest uh, thing of changing light bulbs to vacuuming the floors to whatever it is that needs to be done in the building, whether it's washing dishes or whatever that might be. That's another way that we are oftentimes useful in the local congregation. Certainly we are useful to the kingdom when we can do good for those who are members of the church, if we're, if we're in that uh, position. And also for those outside the church as a method of evangelism. Now, I can look at a number of passages that talk about trying to do good for those within the congregation or without. Let me give you two of them. You are familiar with probably Galatians 6.10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And then he goes on to say, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And so we see that we have the opportunity, if we have the ability to do good for all men, uh, especially those who are Christians. 
Uh, we see Paul in Acts 20, 35 says this. He says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring, you ought to support the weak. Notice that description there again, the weak. Those are the ones who, they can't take care of themselves. They're the ones that meet a certain qualification. <clears throat> He's already addressed, we find in other areas, uh, those who refuse to work and so forth. But he says, here, you work so that you can support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, most of us know somebody who meets this qualification. I mean, somebody who physically, uh, they just can't take care of themselves. Matter of fact, uh, I hate to say this, but the majority of us towards the end of our lives, we're going to fall into that category. Somebody will be taking care of us. Uh, and it's probably going to be the people that we took care of when they were little and unable to take care of themselves. And so uh, we go back and we think a little bit about, we, we sometimes call it the golden rule. We normally get it wrong. You'll hear people say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Listen to Matthew seven twelve. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Basically, what we find is, is we're doing for others the way that we would have others to treat us. Let me let you in on another little secret. The majority of time, people won't treat us the way we ought to be treated, but we're still to treat them the way that they should be treated. That's what we mean when we talk about, oftentimes, this golden rule. Now, if we'll do that, it will help us to be happy people. It also does something else. And I'm going to tell you this because it, it's going to happen probably to the rest of us uh, for as long as we're alive and Christians. When we help other people, this oftentimes will open us up for people to take advantage of us. And if you've not seen it, I assure you it happens. But you know what I say when that happens? Because it will happen. Shame on them. All we can do is right, right? So we help people as we can. We do give them the benefit of the doubt, and yet we also have to use carefulness and caution when we do that. But it will continue to happen. Now, with all that being said, let me say this. Attitudes found out in the world will often carry into local congregations. It's been said there are really three different kinds of people, and you've probably heard this. There are those who are the wills. There are those who are the won'ts. There are those who are the can'ts. The won'ts, those are the people who simply, they won't do what's necessary. It could be a number of reasons why. It may be that they just want somebody else to do it. It may be that they really don't give enough care or interest into whatever it is uh, to want to take part in it. But for whatever reason, they're simply not interested. The next group is the can'ts. It's kind of an interesting group. Sometimes you'll find people that would help if they thought they could, but because they think they can't, they won't. And it could be a number of reasons why. Some because they've never tried. Some people have never tried something, and so they don't know if they can do it, so they don't. Some have never been taught, or they've never learned. Some have never been given an opportunity. Here's another sad example. Oftentimes, people won't try because they've been told by other people that they're not very good at something, or that they're worthless. Uh, most of you have heard of a number of accounts. I know of an account where an elder never sang during worship. This is sad. It's because one day somebody came up and told him that he didn't have a very good singing voice. So he never sang. I don't have a very good singing voice, but I still sing. I believe it's, a, I believe it's beautiful to the one who's listening to it, uh, to which it's aimed, right? So sometimes people have low self-esteem because other people have really knocked them down and tried to keep them down, and so they don't help out. The third group are the wills. They're those who take action and they do what's needed. We sometimes will call them the go-getters. Sometimes people might even call them pushy. Sometimes people may say they're the ones who want to be in charge of everything. I think what you find oftentimes is these are the ones who are forced into acting because the can'ts and the won'ts leave all the work unfinished. So that only leaves the people who are willing to do the rest of the work. Why do I bring all that up? Well, we're talking about being happy. Who do you think's happier? The person who refuses to ever help anybody in life? The person who doesn't think he can help anybody in life? Or the person who actually does, tries, and succeeds? And it may not be a lot, but... I guarantee you the people who try to help others and the people who succeed in doing the work of the Lord, they're the ones who are the happiest. With that being understood, then, we realize that we need to be doers. Then you go back and you look at James 1.25. We actually have it on the board out there unless somebody changed it recently. It was there last week. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, notice this, and continueth therein, in what? The perfect law of liberty. He being not a forgetful hearer of what? This law of liberty we're talking about. Notice that. 
but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It's interesting, a lot of people don't realize how much work is included in the perfect law of liberty. You want to follow God's will, you want to follow the law that's been given to those of us who are Christians, one of the things we understand is there's a lot of work there. But we each need to find areas in which we can serve as we try to carry out this perfect law of liberty. That includes doing well to others and a whole host of things. Now, with all that being said, I am thankful that this is a congregation that's probably a little bit different than most. I would say for the majority of the congregation here, virtually everybody is plugged in in some area uh, in doing the work of the church. And you go back and you think about Jesus, who is a great example. And most of us are familiar with his statement. Listen to Matthew 20, 28. He said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. For those of you who were gone this week down to Memphis, I wasn't down there, but I did hear accounts of certain individuals who always seemed to let everyone else go first while they were cleaning up and doing the work. That's really the attitude that we ought to have. And we think about the example Christ gave for us. We understand as Christians, each of us is a part of the body of Christ. But we understand also that some of us have uh, areas in which we excel where others may not. And notice 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ. You consider all of us here right now. We are the body of Christ. He says, and members in particular. You've got an individual here. Each of us has some, other, some area where we excel where others do not. And those areas are beneficial to the church. Matthew 9, 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, and this is sadly still true for most congregations in the world, the harvest truly is plenteous, meaning there's plenty out there that need to be reached. He says, but the laborers are few. And that's actually becoming, I believe, more and more prominent uh, in today's society. So for those who are here and, and maybe aren't plugged in as well as they should, you might ask, ask yourself, where can I plug in? What things need to be done? Where may I be beneficial? Now, we have to also understand that happiness involves a whole lot more than serving others. Happiness, and this is more important, uh, as we begin to talk about being in a righteous relationship with God. You can't be happy without being in a righteous relationship with God. Listen to John 13, 16, and 17. And, and this is an extremely important thing I wish the religious world could, could seem to come to understand and grasp. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant's not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Jesus' point here, if I were to summarize pretty much what he's talking about in the context here. The people out there in the audience and the people today, they need to have an understanding of, and they need to accept authority. That's a serious problem today. For those in the crowd at that time right there, if they understood who was in their presence and who was the authority, uh, they would have been blessed. We have the same issue today. We are happy as Christians when we understand the relationship and the requirements that we have to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have to have a relationship with Him. And I'm careful when I use that phrase because that phrase is thrown around a lot in today's society. Most of us would acknowledge we want a relationship with the Lord. But if I have a relationship with Jerry, that means I know Jerry. If I have a relationship with Larry, that means I know Larry. The same would go for any relationship. If you have a relationship with somebody, you know them. And therefore, we have to go then to 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. I wish those who talked about having a relationship with Jesus would go to that verse a little more often. I guess we could summarize it by simply saying we need to know God's will and then we need to do it, which is what we've covered so far. And I want you to think about how it is that we as Christians oftentimes will learn something from God's Word that we didn't know, and we'll begin to apply it and we'll begin to teach it to others. Think about how much that actually brings excitement uh, and worthiness to our lives. There's, there is really a, a feeling of satisfaction when we've been struggling with some type of a problem or how it is that we ought to deal with something. And then when we do it the way God wants us to do it, uh, it causes us, or at least it should, to be excited that we could do it according to the, to the will and the words of Christ and uh, the other holy inspired writers. And so here's what we need to, to know. We need to know His will, but we need to do it. And I began to think a little bit about the book of Revelation. You know, I, probably don't spend as much time in Revelation as I should. 
We know that Revelation was written to Christians who were not only at that time enduring persecutions, but they were going to continue to endure uh, terrible persecutions in the future. And to all these Christians, John, he writes the book here of Revelation. And I want you to notice what he starts off in Revelation 1.3. He says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. There's an emphasis again there in Revelation 1.3 that I wish the world would get a little more understanding. Certainly there's a need for us to do. We know that. But as we read this, we see that what we need to be doing is what's written from, from God. We need to be following and doing the Holy Scriptures. Even if we were to face persecutions like these early first century Christians, we can still be happy. Listen to 1 Peter 3.14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. You know, I'll be honest, I've watched a little bit of the, I told you guys I quit watching the news. I did for a while, but I've been watching it just a little bit. Have you guys noticed that it seems to be a, a severe and serious hatred for those who are Christians lately? I mean, in every area, it seems like every time I turn something on, somebody is, is picking on Christianity. But you know what, as I begin to think about that, you know, they're really only picking on what the world considers Christianity. How many of you guys have actually been picked on this week for your faith? I haven't. I've seen people attacking the ideas of Christianity out in the world. But to be honest, what does that really have to do with any of us? None of us, I don't think, have been persecuted like we find these early Christians. And even if we had, we can still be happy. Now, I'll start to draw this to a close. We ought to ask the really important question. We started off talking about being happy. We started talking, off, talking about being useful. We've given a number of areas of, of things that we can do to make us happy or to make us useful. But we, we need to probably ask this question. Why should those who know and obey God's will actually be happy? Well, first of all, God just tells us that's how it's, that's how it's supposed to be. And so we ought to take His word on it. Listen to Revelation 22.7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let me, let me go back and put that in context and correct that before somebody uh, misuses the way that's worded. When it says that Jesus is going to come quickly, it doesn't mean he's coming tomorrow. Uh, it'd be the equivalent of if I were to have a fire in my house and I were to go quickly to the kitchen. Big difference, right? Uh, I can run quickly into my kitchen in a week, in two weeks, or in three weeks, but if I were to go quickly, meaning in the other manner, it means I'm going to come right now. Jesus will, he will just appear. It will be quickly, okay? Now, as you look at Revelation 22, 7, why should people be happy? Well, we find part of it here in Revelation. Jesus is going to come someday. We're told as Christians to be ready, and that if we are ready... Um, we can be ready by keeping the sayings of this book, but we know that we'll be happy because where will we go when we die? Or when the judgment comes, whichever is to take place, we're going to go to heaven. That ought to make us happy. And so we then have to ask, well, what is necessary for us as Christians to be ready? Listen to Revelation twenty-two fourteen. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Well, we now then lead to another question. What exactly are uh, or what is involved in keeping His commandments? There are so many. If you were to try to break it down, what I would break it down to is the requirements prior to Christianity and then the requirements after Christianity. Let me quickly break it down like that. So first, we've got to have our sins washed away in the blood of Jesus. Let me give you another verse for those who may be taking notes. Revelation seven fourteen. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, again, as we see the blood of the Lamb and we see the white there, the idea is the idea of purity, the idea of righteousness. The only those who are in Christ uh, when they die are found pure, are found righteous. Revelation 1.5 says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth... Unto him that loved us, notice, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That is the point at which one becomes a Christian. There are a little bit more involved, and we normally cover that each week. We go back and we can look at the commands not only of Christ himself, but of those who were the 
teachers of the gospel. We know that they were out teaching that they needed to believe or else they would die in their sins, John 8, 24. That they needed to repent of their sins, Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30. That they needed to confess the name of Christ, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And that they needed to be baptized by immersion for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, uh, Peter preached it in Acts 2, 38. If you go back and you look at those people, they have the right to be happy because they've become Christians. And when they become Christians, they have this clean slate, right? They have this new start. Listen to Romans 4, 7 and 8. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Those are those, are those who have become Christians now. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now here's the scary part. You have to die in that situation of purity and cleanliness to not have the Lord impute sin. And so as we begin to look here, we get the understanding it's not enough to get into Christ, I have to stay faithful in Christ. What that means is, is when we sin, we repent and turn back uh, and again work on being faithful. You go back and you'd look at 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. True happiness can only come from God. With that being said, you can't force people to be happy. You can't. How many of you have ever known somebody, it didn't matter how much you tried, they were never happy? But there are some things we can do if we're not happy. I would encourage each of us to look at ourselves and ask ourselves. First of all, ask yourself this, because you can't be happy without it. Are you a Christian? There's no way you're going to be happy if you're not a Christian. If you are a Christian, have you been faithful? Certainly that's required. If you're doing everything you can to be faithful, ask yourself, are you plugged into the congregation? Are you plugged into trying to help others? Are you trying to do whatever it is that you can to make your life beneficial to others, to make your life useful? There are many people who would like to get plugged in and they really just don't know what to do. I would encourage you to try a number of areas and try to find something that, that maybe you're comfortable with. But you yourself have to determine that you want to be happy. If there's a way that we can help you here, whether it's to, to help you be added to the body, whether it's to pray for you because you're struggling in some area, whatever it may be, uh, it is our goal as a congregation to help one another be happy and to be useful, and we'd like to do that this evening. If we can help you in any way, you can simply come forward as we stand and sing a song of invitation.